Good afternoon, parents, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I'm Rachel, Quality Assurance Specialist, Professional and Education Development Division, and your moderator for panel two. This afternoon, we are privileged to have three panel speakers. Firstly, we have Dr. Ng Yi Lin, Senior Education Research Scientist at the National Institute of Education, Singapore. Hello, Dr. Ng. Hi, Hi. Rachel. Good to Hi, see you online. Dr. Ng's research interests relate to early childhood learning and development. She focuses on the children's self-regulation skills and the impact the preschool learning environment has on learning outcomes. Dr. Ng will be enriching us with the topic on the importance of building executive function skills in early childhood. She will review these skills and their importance in children's learning and development. Next, we have Dr. Evelyn Law, Doctor and Assistant Professor at the National University of Singapore, Yong Lu Lin, Singapore of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Law. Hello, hi, thank you for inviting me. Dr. Law has completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and the program in clinical effectiveness at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is part of the Child Development Unit at National University Hospital and a director on Kids Start under the Early Childhood Development Agency and the Ministry of Social and Family Development. Dr. Law is the principal investigator of the Pediatric Brain Health Laboratory and has been awarded research grants by the National Medical Research Council and by Ministry of Education. Dr. Law will be presenting Developing Executive Function Skills at Home. She will share the science behind parents who have been successful in building children's executive function skills and will guide you through the various techniques to optimize these skills. And lastly, we have Ms. Joyce Lim, independent, uh, independent coach. Hello, Ms. Joyce. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Very happy to be here. With over 20 years of early childhood education experience in China and Singapore, Ms. Joyce's proprietary quotient program continues to positively impact her clients. Certified in parent effectiveness training and movement-based learning, she has owned and operated facilities in both private and, pri private and public sectors. Ms. Joyce will be sharing the effects of parents-child connections on the development of executive function skills. She will share how parents-child relations affect the development of these skills. She will also touch on the essence of connection in all areas of development and maintaining supportive and reliable relationships. So the format of this panel will look like this. Each of our panel speakers will be sharing their topic for about 20 minutes, and we will have our Q&A after the presentation from our third speaker. In the meantime, should you have any queries you would like our speakers to address, you may leave it in the chat box. Now, let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ng Yi Lin, to bring us through the topic on the importance of building executive function skills in early childhood. Dr. Ng, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna... Uh, okay. I hope you're able to see my slides. And so um, I'm very happy to be here today to share with you about the importance of building executive functioning skills or EF skills in early childhood. So these are the three topics that I'll try to cover in my talk today around the different topics of EF. And the aim is to give you a better understanding of what these different skills are and why these are important skills for our children to develop, especially during the early childhood years, and some ideas about how we can support our children's development. So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about how we as parents use EF for executive functioning skills in many areas of our lives. So I think the scenes that are shown on the screen here are probably quite familiar to most of us. 
as parents, we are always juggling different tasks or we're probably doing multiple things at the same time or are thinking about different things in our mind while doing something. We may have to remember our children's schedules, their medical appointments, uh, what activities they have when, when their exams are, all while managing our own work appointments. And we, if we have more than one child, we can start to imagine how many different things we have to juggle at any one point. And so executive functioning skills refers to this set of skills that really help us to manage our busy lives by helping us to regulate the flow of information that's coming into us, by helping us to pay attention to the events or the information that is currently important to whatever we're doing at this point, help us to make plans to accomplish certain goals, help us to switch between different tasks or to also control our behavioral and emotional impulses. So for example, I'll just take um, behavioral or emotional impulses. If you look at one of the pictures um, on the bottom left of the screen, you've got a parent who's trying to manage um, his child while also trying to do some work. So there might be a lot of frustration um, going on in a parent's mind, but he's got to learn or use his executive functioning skills to sort of try and control his frustration while still managing all the things that are happening around him. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to go a little in depth into what are the three main components of executive functioning and to tell you a little bit about what each of them are. So there are three main components of executive functioning, working memory, cognitive flexibility, as well as inhibitory control. So the first one, which is working memory, is really about of being able to keep information in our mind and manipulating it in some way to achieve a certain goal or to complete a certain task. So if you think about our children or even ourselves as adults, when we read a story, we are trying to understand what the story is about. We are really using our working memory to help us to combine different pieces of information that is presented to us in the story and to put it together into a coherent whole. So using our working memory, we are able to understand what different characters are doing and how one event uh, is related to a different event that is happening within that story. Uh, on a more uh, practical side of things, uh, we also use our working memory when we are shopping for grocery items. For example, um, if we are able to keep in mind the list of items that we would like to buy, and then we update the list in our mind as we purchase the items at the grocery store. That's also another example of manipulating information according to our goal of completing our shopping and making sure that we buy everything that we need. So that's essentially working memory. And the next one is cognitive flexibility, which is being able to think about something in different ways or multiple ways, and also being able to shift our attention in response to the different demands uh, of a particular event or a task. So in terms of um, when we talk to each other or when we interact with other people, if we are good in our mental flexibility or cognitive flexibility, we are able to consider someone else's perspectives and ideas. And typically for young children, this is something that may be quite difficult to do in the beginning uh, when they are just starting to develop these skills. It, um, being able to... Uh, accept other people's perspectives or ideas is something that um, children uh, have to work on. Another example would be if we are trying to solve a difficult problem and if we find that the current strategy that we are using to try and solve the problem is not working, then cognitive flexibility allows us to then shift and think about employing another strategy to solve that particular problem. So a common example might be if you're trying to solve a math problem and the first strategy that you try is just not working. Now, if you're flexible enough, you would know that, okay, it's time for me to shift and try a different strategy rather than just perseverate and try using the original strategy just because you can't be flexible enough to switch. The third one is what we call inhibitory control. And this is about intentionally suppressing our attention and our responses to a particular event. So I'm using math again as an example here. So um, when children start learning how to add, they usually start with um, adding whole numbers. And that has a specific set of rules. But then when they switch to learning how to add fractions, the rules of addition change because you deal with the denominator and the numerator in a different way. So having good inhibitory control 
And also to some extent, cognitive flexibility allows you to recognize that you're learning something new and you're able to flexibly just forget about what you learn when you added whole numbers and are able to learn these new rules about learning how to add fractions. Another example of inhibitory control would be being able to ignore distractions that are happening around you. So for example, um, being able to focus on completing a test without being distracted by construction noise or any other kind of noise that's happening around you. So in a nutshell, those are the three different um, components of uh, executive functioning that we typically talk about. And we use these executive functioning skills um, typically in concert. So we may use um, all three of them together in our daily lives um, to do different things. So why is it important um, to have these EF skills, especially um, for children? So the first um, point I wanted to share here is that these EF skills actually enable children to perform more complex skills that are important for school success. So we can think about executive functioning skills as sort of like the building blocks of more complex skills that include things like problem solving, setting goals, being able to persist on a difficult challenge, um, being able to regulate your emotions, either when you're frustrated or angry or sad, or even when you're happy. And also being able to be attentive and focused on your current uh, task. And all of these different skills are important for school success. Uh, research has shown us that children who are stronger in these skills, they are more actively engaged in learning at school because they are able to focus their attention on what's being taught, they are able to inhibit distractions. Um, they don't think about other things when lessons are going on. Um, they are able to remember and follow multi-step instructions that teachers may give to them. And they are also able to set goals. For example, they could uh, tell themselves that, okay, I have to complete this worksheet before the lesson ends. And they can also devise a plan to make sure that they achieve these goals. Now, in classrooms, children always have to deal with challenging tasks. A child who has good executive functioning skills is able to manage all the different frustration, emotions that they feel or disappointment when something that they do is not successful. They are able to manage all these different emotions and then still tell themselves to come back to this task and to continue to persevere on trying to solve it. Apart from... Uh, Contributing to, to um, academic success, EF skills are also important in terms of maintaining positive social relationships and friendships in the school setting. And how this happens is because children who are able to regulate their emotions, children who are able to see their friends' point of view, they are better able to engage in social interactions and be able to forge friendships that they are able to then maintain. And EF skills also help children to play and to work cooperatively with peers because they are able to um, constructively resolve conflicts or disagreements that may occur um, during all of these different interactions. Um, EF skills also are important uh, in terms of helping children to adjust to new environments. And over the past two years, um, one of the main transitions that our children had to go through was um, whether you're in preschool or primary school or secondary school, you had to suddenly transition to home-based learning. And that is a huge um, change for a lot of our students. Another common transition that all children go through is uh, moving from a preschool environment to a primary school environment. So when we adjust to new environments, there are many new things that we have to learn to adapt to we have to um, learn how to acquire new skills. We have to also maybe take on new roles and responsibilities, and maybe also develop new friendships or new relationships with new teachers when we move from, let's say, preschool to primary school. So all of these things that we have to navigate when we transition to different environments can be helped if we have strong executive functioning skills. Again, because these skills then make us better equipped to be able to deal with these new challenges and to be able to um, adapt and to change our way of behavior and the way we think 
so that we can adjust to these new environments. So given all these different um, importance of EF skills and how it contributes to our children's development, you might wonder, well, then why is it so important that we build these skills during the early childhood years, during the ages um, from three to six? Why is it that this age is important? Well, research has shown us that EM skills develop um, very early on um, in infancy, and it continues to develop all the way up to adolescence and adulthood. So EM skills actually develop over a very long period of time. But research has also shown us that these skills develop quite rapidly around the early childhood years, which is between the ages of two to six. And what this means is that when the skills are developing rapidly at this time, it's also an opportune time for us to provide the relevant support so that our children are best uh, positioned to be able to develop these skills during the early childhood years. Um, another reason for why EF skills is important to develop during early childhood is because EF skills play a very important role in the child's holistic development. That means it contributes to children's development in various areas, including their cognitive development, their behavioral development, as well as their social emotional development. Moreover, research has also shown us that EF skills are linked to outcomes in adulthood. So it predicts um, how well we do as we grow up. It, it contributes to many different aspects of our adult life, um, including our physical health, um, the extent to which uh, we achieve financial success, our educational attainment, as well as our social and emotional well-being. So because of all of these um, positive effects that EF skills could have, then it becomes very important for us to ensure that our children have the uh, relevant support uh, and the opportunities to practice and to build their EF skills during early childhood. And so now I'm going to jump into how we can help our children to develop executive functioning skills. And I'm just going to talk about um, a couple of points. The first point that I wanted to mention is this idea of scaffolding. And this really is about the idea that um, scaffolding is a technique that adults use to help young children to practice emerging skills before children can perform them on their own. So within the context of EF, um, we need to remember that all children are born with the potential to develop their EF skills. They are not born with the EF skills to begin with, but every child has the potential to develop these skills. And so within that context, the support from adults, be it from parents or teachers, is very crucial to aid in children's development in these EF skills. So scaffolding works by providing sort of like a stepping stone to introduce or to support a new skill, and it allows for children to practice these skills. So think of it as, um, think of scaffolding as like a ladder that you're helping the child to climb. The child might be on the first rung of the ladder at this point, and you're trying to provide sufficient help so that the child can then go onto the second rung. And the amount of, um, the key here is to um, think about what kind of help and support you provide to the child so that the child is able to then move on to the next rung. You want to be able to provide just enough support so that the child can still um, slowly find his or her way up to the second rung. But if you realize that your child is struggling a little bit with the level of support that you're providing, then maybe you want to increase that level of support a little bit. But if you find that, okay, the child seems to be succeeding, seems to be moving up towards that second rung, then maybe you decrease the level of support and let the child develop that independence of um, using um, the EF skill that you're trying to support. So I'll give you an example of uh, maybe setting a time for homework for um, a child who has just started primary one. Um, one of the things that I realized with my own son when he started primary one was that it, became a, it was a huge struggle for him to try to sit down at a certain time after school to complete his homework. And so what we tried to do was to first set a specific time each day for school. Uh, sorry, set up a specific time each day after school for homework at an area that is free of distraction. And maybe in the beginning, we have to provide reminders to our child to say, hey, you know, it's almost three o'clock now, it's time for your homework. So maybe why don't you get started on it? 
And this may have to be done over a period of, I don't know, a few weeks. It depends on the individual child. But then gradually, you might find that your child is able to get himself or herself ready to start homework at the appointed time of 3 p.m. And then you can stop providing your reminders. And um, during that time, um, then you continue to observe and to provide support and encouragement. When the child is able to adhere to this homework time, you provide encouragement or praise. Um, but if they fail to do it on certain days, then be there to provide encouragement and say, uh, maybe you start giving your reminders again. So this is the aspect of providing more or less support depending on what your child needs. So eventually, um, your child would then realize that um, this is um, time for me to do my homework and then the child is able to regulate his or own, her own behavior. As a parent, you could also model the appropriate behavior by maybe setting aside a time at home for you to do certain things and then you keep to that schedule so that your child can also see how you set a schedule for yourself to do something. So that's an example of scaffolding. And the second point I wanted to talk about is um, this idea of social play or play um, among children. It's also another great opportunity for children to practice and to test their emerging um, executive functioning skills. Because when children play with one another, be it with their siblings or their friends downstairs at the playground, um, they are doing a lot of things that require their EF skills. And this is the time for them to try using out these EF skills without having the adult support around to scaffold and to help them. So some of the things that children do are they have to make choices, which game to play. They have to negotiate taking turns with their friends. Um, they also have to direct their own play. So if they are trying to do a um, act out a scene, for example, they have to um, assign roles to each of their friends and then they have to kind of direct how, what each character is going to go. And then the child also has to bear in mind what's happening during this um, acting out of the play, uh, what happens next. So all of these are activities um, that require children to use their EF skills. So then social play becomes a very good uh, opportunity for children to apply these skills and to hone these skills um, while playing with their friends. As parents, what we can do during these social play activities is to be there for our children if they come home and they tell us, you know, when I play with this friend, uh, he or she wasn't very nice, he didn't want to listen to my ideas. And when you, your child comes back with these um, uh, stories, then as a parent, we can then try to work with them and try to scaffold a little bit more of these EF skills so that eventually they can then uh, go on to work uh, and practice their executive functioning skills. And so with that, uh, I've come to the end of my talk. Uh, I just wanted to share three main um, takeaways that I hope you have been able to get from my sharing today. Um, EF skills are very important because they support the processes of learning that enable our children to both effectively and efficiently master the content or whatever they're trying to learn. EF skills are also important because it facilitates children's interpersonal interactions and their behaviors. And we can support children's EF skills development as parents by providing scaffolding and giving them opportunities to practice these skills within a very supportive and warm environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ng, for your valuable sharing. I'm sure our parents have a better understanding on the importance of executive function skills and how we can support and scaffold children's learning and development in the classroom, social setting, and at home. All right. So before we move on to our second speaker, I would like to remind parents to drop any question you may have for Dr. Ng into the chat box, and we will address them later at the Q&A segment. Next up, let's welcome our second speaker, Dr. Evelyn Law. Her topic for today is developing executive function skills at home. Over to you, Dr. Law. Hello, everyone. Um, let me share screen with everyone. Okay, I think you see the screen there. Okay, so um, thank you to Dr. Ng for um, a very comprehensive uh, introduction. So we can really jump right into some of the things that we could do at home. Okay. 
So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, when, why, where, and how um, for executive function skills. Um, it sounds very complicated, but I want to make it a bit easier for everyone to understand. So in terms of what to develop, do we develop all the skills all at once? Um, as Dr. Ung has mentioned, it's not just, you know, a single ability, but many different skills. And this morning, I think um, at the opening, uh, we heard about knowing and observing your child's strengths and difficulties. I think by observing your own child, you could figure out what are areas that, that are more difficult, and those are really areas to develop. And it also depends on the child's age. So there's not gonna be one set of rules in terms of what to do at home. And um, I don't know your home situation. Um, also this morning, uh, we, we heard about how uh, children have different temperament. They're like flowers, they can be orchids, they can be tulips or dandelions. So with every child of our own, even though we parent the same way, the child can be very different. So um, I think in terms of what to develop, it's you as a parent to look at all these skills um, and decide, hmm, what is the area that my child probably needs to develop more? And then in terms of when to develop, I know that Dr. Ung also mentioned, um, if you see that I drew this red color, um, this is executive function development. And you can see that during those preschool years is very important um, to develop the executive function skills. You might think to yourself, oh no, I missed it for my first child, let's say. Um, these skills actually continue to grow until um, someone is about 25 to 30 years, so into adulthood. So there are definitely chances for that. Um, and if you're curious about um, different executive function um, skills and when are the sensitive periods, um, you can definitely look at this citation from um, the Center of Developing Child it ha actually has a lot of resources on that. So moving right along, I think the last talk was um, all about why. Um, so I'm not going to repeat a lot of this, um, but the way that I see it, and if you read the book called Mine in the Making, executive function skills really become the life skills that the child needs. And it's kind of like the roots of a tree. If you're looking for the fruits of academics and social emotional skills to blossom, you really need that foundation. And as a pediatrician, I guess um, we mentioned health earlier on, right? Um, even adult health, um, executive function has something to do with. Um, this is this picture here is directly from the study. It does show that with high executive function skills, which is at number five at the bottom there, I know it's really small on your screen. Um, you could see that in terms of the outcome, um, it could be lower. You might say, well, how does that relate? I'll give you an example. If let's say um, you have some difficulties with impulsivity, you might end up eating, um, maybe snacking quite a bit, and maybe obesity become an issue for you. And that might have implications for later physical health. That's just one example. But we could also see that even substance dependence, whether it's reported by the adults in this study, it's actually done in New Zealand, um, and whether reported by others, if you have better executive function skills, which mean at the number one at the bottom, the low um, the, um, in terms of just having, um, oh, sorry, I flipped it. High executive fu function skills are those whose outcome is actually better, less problems. And if you have low executive function skills, sorry about that, um, you would have more of those type of issues, including substance, um, use. 
So you could see it's it's very important important topic to talk about, and there are definitely opportunities at home every day. Um, at the very end, I'll talk about if you're a working mother, um, if you just lack time, um, where do we go from there, okay? Um, but I do think that even during those normal routines, bath, shower time, meal times, those are times when we could develop these skills. And as the picture indicate, it's not going to be one size fits all. So um, I think a lot of the strategies I have um, are already discussed. But um, I guess what you could take from it is with different strategies, you pick the ones that work the most for you. And I could also bring in a different perspective in terms of how some of these strategies might fit into your day. Okay, so just something really general um, for uh, caregivers, as well as parents, grandparents, helpers. Um, one thing that's brought up actually in the last panel was uh, really fostering um, a safe environment. I think um, I think that uh, Miss Kelly Tay used the word like um, flight or uh, fight or flight, right? So I think the first thing um, for parents to really understand is before we do any training with our children for executive function, they really do have to feel safe. So feeling safe, not just physically, but emotionally and relationally. And I think later on, um, uh, uh, Ms. Joyce Lim will definitely talk about the relational part of things. But you could see how that comes into play. If you're very stressed or you feel that your child's not doing as well. Um, earlier this morning, I heard some questions on children with ADHD symptoms. And I think when the child might not be meeting that certain expectations that we would like, we might say things that make the child feel unsafe. And that's actually a really hard environment for executive function to, to um, uh, uh, improve or be promoted. So I think that's just the first point is that we do want to make sure that the environment can be as calm and as predictable as possible. And I know that's not possible with all the pictures we've just seen, right, from the last talk. Predictable means not that you can predict everything, but a parent that's more predictable means that they will always have that nurture or by the end of the day, my mother or my father is responsible for their feelings and behaviors and say, hey, I'm sorry for, you, you know, uh, losing my cool today. That's sort of predictable. Unpredictable is when a child or when a parent is often out of control. And that's the type of um, interaction that is the most difficult for children because they get very guilty um, at the end. So, I do think that this is an important point. And I guess to illustrate it even more for those who are visual, if this is happening to you, um, right? If you're being accused every day, um, as someone's attacking you, like this lion's coming at you, is really difficult to learn. You're gonna freeze, you're gonna wanna fight or flight. Um, and um, this book down here, I don't know if you see it um, later on. Um, I think that someone from NLB will actually talk more about it, but um, um, it has a really good chapter about checking on your own emotional control. So why am I talking about all these things? And I try to make this a bit easier. Um, as someone uh, who has a neuroscience lab, sometimes we get so complicated, right, with all the words. But think of the brain as like an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. And the downstairs brain is really responsible for you staying safe. So the fight and flight, you know, um, that happens. And the upstairs brain is really responsible for your thinking. So um, your goal setting, your executive functions. And in order for the upstairs brain to work, the downstairs brain needs to feel safe. 
And so um, if you forget everything that we talked about, I think it's important to understand that a very stressed brain, a lot of times the downstair brain kind of takes over and there's no access, our little access to the upstairs brain. Um, and so as parents, um, certainly um, we can't protect the child from many, many different things, um, but just be mindful of negative stress. And maybe I might be speaking to parents who are adding that negative stress in their child's life, maybe, um, you know, whining every day, like, why can't you get the 100, you know, etc. cetera. Um, so I think it's a good time to just examine what's your expectation? Is it for perfection? Are we unintentionally maybe sometimes adding some of this negative stress? And um, really, if our end goal is for our child to move towards healthy social emotional well-being, um, we're going to have to balance some things out um, in terms of achievement and feeling happy and staying stable. Um, and I do want to put a word in for positive stress. I think we just talked about scaffolding and all of that and the ladder and the each rung. Um, this is basically the same slide. Um, but, you know, if you look at this target, this blue target, right, can't do even with uh, guidance can do independently. We don't want the child to always sit in can do independently because then they won't be motivated to um, do something so easy. But um, there's a different word for, you know, the zone that is can do if guided, and that's the zone of proximal development. Um, I know it's a difficult term, but um, uh, that's the kind of positive stress we're looking for, that the child feels empowered. I did it. I'm willing to put in the effort. And so um, the scaffolding, um, I think I think Dr. Ang did a really fantastic job. This is when Jewel was um, being built. We know that the scaffolding at some point needs to leave. So it's that, you know, um, mindset of I'm going to support you now when you need it, but eventually we're moving towards independence. And sometimes positive stress can also be those small va um, failures. Um, and so we're not saying no failure. We do want some of this failure to come up. Um, and so later on, I'm going to talk about one strategy on how to deal with um, failures. Okay, so um, now that we kind of have an understanding of the kind of predictable environment that we need to go into, um, let's quickly talk a little bit about um, the different strategies. And I broke it down into what Dr. Ang just mentioned, the emotional control, working memory, um, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control. So those are difficult words, but I'm going to just um, try to um, maybe make it a little bit easier. Um, we just finished a panel on um, mindful parenting. So I, I'm not going to go in depth into this, but really you and the child, um, that interaction is like a dance, right? Um, in order for the child to really start to have or gain emotional control, which is an important part of executive function, their downstairs brain really cannot be revved up too much. And so I'm not going to go into everything that's already discussed just now with mindful parenting, but I myself have a really, really difficult time. Um, I do have a child who has very poor emotional control, and it took me a long time to figure out what's the strategy for me to stay calm so that my child's upstairs brain, the part of the brain that thinks, can actually start working. And I've tried many, many things, and I, I know that there are um, parents here who have tried different things. And I think Miss Kelly Tay said it, you know, um, perfect just now is that, you know, um, it's it's really easier said than done. Um, 
But I think if we practice, um, we can do it really well. So some ways, you know, might be just to walk away um, for a while. I actually walk into the bathroom of the home and lock the door just because I feel like my yelling was not beneficial to my child. Um, or even learn to actively ignore. Sometimes ignore doesn't mean I'm leaving my child. It's not being passive. It's that I know that if I scream, my child's not going to learn emotional control. And therefore, I actively just kind of, you know, um, leave the situation. What I find helpful is actually when my child has an outburst, outburst, I actually start videotaping. Okay, the child might feel really uncomfortable, but actually it helps calm me and I can watch it over and actually rehearse like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Um, it was just my own um, feelings, expectations. Um, a lot of times it's just us like, telling ourselves, oh, our child needed to be this way, or maybe um, other people are watching me. So sometimes my thought actually gets in the way. Um, so that's one, one important part. So once you're calm and safe, how do we help our child? I think the most important part about this is um, that we do have to have some common language with our child. Um, for my child, I usually will say, is this big deal or small deal? Big deal means it matters in five years, right? Whenever you have situations happen or when your child's about to blow up, um, you could say, hey, are you safe or not safe? Not safe is if there's like a fire going on. Um, or is this a must or is it a want or is this a necessity, right? So a lot of times we can, um, if we use these languages, um, we can actually remind our child, is this a big deal or small deal, right? And using a thermometer sometimes really help them. Um, and it's the same thing as um, uh, this morning. We, we talked about like the child actually is feeling one way and you're telling to them to do something else. And I think a lot of times we need to just say like, hey, you're safe. I'm here to listen, right? So even adding those little bits instead of starting accusing the child and yelling and screaming, right? But I think it's good to always say, hey, today we have like a number 10 moment. You had a huge tantrum. Can we just think a little bit? Is it really big deal or small deal? Um, so have some type of secret signal or words where you can actually hint at the child so that they can readjust their thermometer. Not all the time is it 10. And I use that with my patients and actually three-year-old, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, they're able to do that. And after a while, they realize, hey, this is not something I must have. It's not like the one food that I have today, this is not an emergency. And a lot of times it does can help with this part of the emotional control or executive function. So moving right along, once your upstairs brain is ready, you can do many things. Um, and one um, is Dr. I think Eva Loud this morning talked about then um, identifying the emotion of the child. If you saw those two vignettes, right, of the videos, what the parent did correct the second time was, hey, I saw what happened. I know you're upset. And the child just basically stopped. So a lot of times um, around my home, I have all these posted <laughs> posters of um, facial expressions. We talk about those um, on a daily basis. So then when it it comes time, I could say, hey, <laughs> you're looking like that little bear that's not so happy. Um, I bet it's because. And then if there is that understanding, it's much easier than to go to the next step, which is really the problem solving. So this is also just a repeat of what Dr. Ang mentioned, um, is um, a lot of times problem solving initially 
um, a three is three year olds not going to be like, OK, now I know what to do. Right. So it helps if parent gave enough support and, you know, your child. What if we did this? Or I sometimes, let's say, had a horrible day at, at, at um, work and I would come home and say, wow, I made a mistake today. I was so loud to my coworker um, and model how you address um, or deal with your mistakes. Or if I um, said something wrong, I'm like, oops, I make mistakes all the time. It's okay. Um, so you do have to model. And sometimes we look too perfect to a child and that's obviously not helpful for their emotional control. Okay, so another part about problem solving is actually work constantly working on a child's um, cognitive flexibility. And this is the one about shifting mindset. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly, but um, really the, you know, you could always every day play the what if game. What if Sam I am, if they're familiar with this book, likes green chicken rice, not green eggs and ham, right? What if the world has no mosquitoes? You can um, keep reading those, but you know, it actually helps the child knows, hey, it, it, things doesn't need to be just one way. And so when they're something goes wrong, they can problem solve and say, hey, I got another way. Um, another way is to always say, hey, plan number one didn't work. What's your plan number two? Plan A versus plan B. I do these with my patients and sometimes they'll say like, oh yeah, you know, plan A really didn't work this week. And I thought of this. Um, so this is just everyday thing you can do at home. Um, and then some parents want to even spend time like thinking about how to help their child shift from one situation to another. And a lot of us already know using a timer, like if it's play and then dinner, they use a timer. But what is actually pretty fun, I call it Busy Bee, is you set up maybe three stations at your home and you have a timer um, and basically one station could be something really enticing like watching an, um, even an iPad show, right? The other one can be spooning like uncooked rice and then a third station, you can set up different things. And the idea is no matter how enticing, one minute is up, the child needs to go to the next station. You can have a final reward, but at least this helps a child being able to shift mindset quickly. And this is just a quick note is that we know um, that screen time actually do have an effect on emotional um, and executive function. And um, this is just really quickly a study that's been done, just having a child watch something about a sponge under the sea. Um, um, and these are kids of preschool age just for four minutes and an educational show and then drawing. And guess what? When we have the kids actually do an executive function game afterwards, those who participated in drawing um, actually did better. So it's really kind of that fast pace and that fantastical, um, uh, you know, uh, unreal cartoon that sometimes gets in the way of us accessing the upstairs brain. And so this is not an exhaustive list, but what I'm trying to say is a lot of times we're really stressed at home. We don't actually need to go and buy games. Um, we're really, you know, th simple things like Simon Says or, you know, um, uh, red light, green light, head, shoulders, knees and toes. If you don't know how that's being played is if the mom says heads and they have to touch their toes. So you can see videos of all of this. So you don't actually need all this material, but most of our home have memory, right? Those are already working on the executive function. So we don't actually need to spend so much effort in building the home um, to do something like that. 
Okay, and then very quickly, um, these are little toys that in Singapore, McDonald's have been, you know, it comes with the meal, um, happy meals. And if you have little figurines, it's perfect for boosting working memory. For example, um, if you've been looking, what is missing, right? So you can use three figurines, tick away one, and, you know, that's already very good for executive function and make it even harder. It's actually the same too. Um, it's uh, Apple Jack and um, our little flash guy um, that's missing. Okay, so this is really the last slide, but I do want to spend some time um, just mentioning, because I know there are parents with children with ADHD and I take care of them um, in the clinical setting. I do want you to acknowledge yourself for putting in the extraordinary um, work. Um, it's very difficult uh, to parent a child with pretty impaired emotional um, executive functions. And so how do we get a child to actually learn what is right? We a lot of times get in this kind of battle or this cycle of just, okay, because they can't motivate themselves, we'll give them all this reward after to push them, right? But what I found with my own child that helps, she's now 12, is that persistence is actually built, not just simply praising, but a Firming them, and I know many speakers talked about it today, but it's not the end goal, it's not about how pretty or handsome they are, but affirming their self regulation. So, you like, oh, I really liked how you use your word to tell me you're not happy, or um, I really like that you tried so hard, or you're staying calm. And some parents will say, my child only has two seconds of attention. They're gone. How do I do it? How do I help the child to persist? And sometimes it might mean that you say, wow, you sat longer than yesterday. Wow, that's good. Being so specific and doing the affirmation during the moment, it is one of the best motivator for ch children to persist. So try that this week. There was one point in my life I could not take my child to the supermarket. It was just impossible. But with this, this is actually from incredible years, um, being able to help my child do this persistence coaching um, has really changed um, what I can do in my everyday, okay? Um, and if you have no time, and this is being brought up, it's not the quantity, 10 minutes, let the child just literally wake up in the morning and say for 10 minutes, what do you wanna do? So even if your child wants to be Simba and climb on you, or even if your child wants you to squirm for 10 minutes, you can do it as an adult. And when they're in charge, they feel safe, they feel in control, they are positive and they're motivated. And sometimes you yourself can be like, okay, I can tolerate five more minutes of this. It prolongs your focus as well as the child's. And Dr. Ong has rightfully said, social play helps with executive function, but also unstructured and child-directed play at home. That's actually the best for executive function. So if you have no time, your child can join in with your routines. You can ask things like, what if we did this differently? What if we do this? You can build many things into your daily life. And if it's just 10 minutes because you have three jobs and you're really quite stressed out, those 10 minutes, some people call it the mind, body, and soul time, as you can see in one of the citation. Um, it has also saved my life. Um, sometimes I try to work for 10 hours while partially feeling guilty. It's better just to start my Saturday, even though I have a whole day of work, 10 minutes full presence with my child. So I'm going to end right here. There are many resources. This is not exclusive, but I do find that these resources, if let's say you, wasn't, you weren't able to tune in completely just now, 
Um, this will give you kind of the depth and breadth of what you can do at home to train your child's executive function. And it's not supposed to be difficult or add extra stress in your life. Okay, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Law, for your wonderful sharing. All right, like what Dr. Law has mentioned, there is no one-size-fits-all one size solution as raising a child comes with many unknowns. So our role as a caregiver is to, get, to, to first provide a safe environment and also to use the various techniques or games as a starting point to optimize this executive function skills at home. All right, before we move on to the last speaker, so um, a gentle reminder to drop your question for Dr. Law into the chat box. Okay, so now we have Miss Joyce. She will be sharing the effects of parent-child connections on the development of executive function skills. Miss Joyce, please. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Law and Dr. Ng, sharing about the importance of executive function skills, as well as what we can all do at home with our child without much stress, isn't it? All right, let me share my screen with all of you. Okay. Okay, today what I'm going to share with all of you about is the effects of parent-child connections on the development of executive function skills. So the keyword is connections. Okay, so before I go further, I'd like to share this short paragraph from Harvard University Center of Deve Developing Child. Adults can facilitate the development of a child's executive function skills. And it, it has been mentioned by Dr. Ng and Dr. Law. Here, summed up three things. Number one is establishing routines. Number two is modeling social behavior. And the third one, creating and maintaining supportive, reliable relationships. I've highlighted that because that's what I'm going to share more about. And it is also important for children to exercise their developing skills through activities. As mentioned earlier by Dr. Law, that foster creative play and social connection and teach them how to cope with stress, involve vigorous exercise, and over time, provide opportunities for directing their own actions with decreasing adult supervision. As also mentioned by Dr. Ng earlier, which is scaffolding. So in the beginning, we might need to handhold them so that they work within their zone of proximal development. And then later on, decrease that adult supervision and let go bit by bit when they soon enough they would be able to do it independently and we will have another task to help them with yeah now i'm going to do a simple exercise with all of you yes those of you who are watching this live online so i've collated 11 skills okay 11 skills um that's related to executive functioning and I'm going to flash them in four parts. And I would like you to think, how often do you do this? Is it on a daily basis or on a weekly basis? All right. So here we go. Oops. Okay, the first set, planning. You plan every day. Meal planning. Time management. You know, now you spend time at this conference after that what are you going to do you know going to go out with your family or have another appointment task initiation how often do we do this is it daily weekly organization be it organizing a party or you know organizing your space problem solving as mentioned quite a bit by our two other speakers Connective flexibility. Okay, I have a really simple example. Like for example, if you go to the market to eat and you know, the chicken rice store is closed. So would you be able to, do you practice that connective flexibility? 
So I'll insist that, you know, if there's no chicken rice, I'm not going to eat anything else. Yeah. So how often do you do this? Working memory, emotional control or management, impulse control and inhibition that leads to delayed gratification as well. So whether, you know, we want to do our work first before having that ice cream or, you know, we have to eat that ice cream. So that impulse control. And what we are con very concerned with, with our children, focus, the attentional control or task monitoring and self-monitoring, the ability to reflect on what we do. So have a think, all the skills that's on the screen, how often do you do this? Is it on a daily basis or, you know, even within a week? Yeah, I'll tell you what's the use of this. Have a think. All the skills related to executive functioning. How often do we do this? Actually, I think most of it, you will have a glance. Probably we would have done it almost every day. Now, so at the start, I mean, you know, when every one of us come on screen or when I come on screen, you would have maybe have subconsciously have a connection with me or not so much of a connection. And looking at this relationship that we have, although quite remotely, if you think that you have a connection with me, then maybe this 20 minutes you will have a better takeaway. Okay, so the connection, what I'm trying to say here is that the connection directly impact the basis, the foundation of that learning. Yes, and or we could think about, you know, when we were younger, when we were at school. So do you remember that teacher that we like a little more than others? Translate to, we enjoy the subject a little bit more. And then that translate to us learning that subject better. So that connection, I view it as the basis or rather the foundation of all learnings. So how do we maintain that with our children? How do we maintain that supportive, reliable relationships that I see it as a foundation for learnings or the boost to their state of learning? And with that, we look at the routines, yeah? Dr. Law and Dr. Ng have mentioned about it. Let me reiterate it in a slightly different sense. I mean, about the same, but slightly different. So routines, right? We establish routines. What does it mean to a child if you have infants at home? So probably when they wake up, you have milk, have some activities, and then, you know, they go for their morning nap and wake up for milk, you know, for each and every family it could be slightly different. But by establishing that routine that you have with your child, what are we essentially doing? We are having this consistency that's being built. And with that consistency, the child would have what Dr. Law mentioned, the predictability. So they know that, hey, you know, after this milk that I'm going to have in the morning, I'm going to have some activities or, you know, mommy's going to take me up for a straw or something like that, that consistency. And with that, the emotional management will be easier. And in fact, by establishing that routine, I would see that as the starting point of them learning about time. So you would think that time now is like 4.30. That is the physical time that we are looking at. But to a very, very young child, they look at time in segments. What do they do? So when you have that consistency established, you are actually showing them time and if later on translate into time management and even organization. So the establishing routines is very important in facilitating the development of executive functions. 
And next, with all of this, the previous exercise that I did with all of you, that everything that we do, I mean, we do it so often, the skills that we utilize in our daily life, right, has got to do with executive functioning. And so what could we do? We could role model that. Okay, role model that. I know it's not easy, as I always share. Parenting is probably the toughest job on earth. And without anybody asking you, sometimes you're hired. Yes, so we have to be, you know, that role model in their life. And sometimes it can be tough. And we need to have compassion with ourselves too. So there's two parts. The main layer the foundation is the connection that we have our, with our children and establishing by establishing routines and being the role model will help to facilitate the development of executive functions. Now, you will ask, you know, connection, maintaining supportive, reliable relationships, right? What is it all about? Or some of you would have would be thinking, you know, this thought bubbles will come out. You know, I'm already spending time with my child. So I would have that connection. Yes, you're right. Very right. You have the connection. And aren't I already being very connected with my child? Also, right? Yes. But how do we deepen that? How do we deepen that connection? And, you know, the role modeling part, I forgot to share this, as in, you know, if we talk about wanting the kids to calm down, so when we want the kids to calm down, right, how do we role model that? We could, we always talk about, you know, taking a moment to breathe. And so when they are having their big emotions, we can start by doing it ourselves, together with them, scaffold that, as in breathe in and out, in, in and out. Okay, so with that, you're role modeling that breathing when they have big emotions or when even when you have big emotions. And that helps them to regulate the emotions, the big emotions that they have. So when we think about this, how do we do that? So the main thing is, how do we deepen that connection? How do we deepen that connection with our children to form that foundation for them to learn executive functioning skills? And to be honest, that would be the foundation for them to learn almost everything and anything. So what should we do? So as we have agreed, that's the connection that we need to have with our children, right? So that is the foundation. Like that's the connection that you have with me right now that might affect the amount of takeaways you have today. So one of the things would be company. What do I mean by that? Earlier speakers would have mentioned about the mindful being a mindful parent. As of today, with all the gadgets, the iPad, the iPhones, I feel that company is getting a little scarce. We might be physically present, but we might not be there. So we have to be mindful about how much time and really it's not about the quantity, as Dr. Law mentioned, it's really about the quality. So when you spend that, what Dr. Law talks about, the 10 minutes, how do we spend it mindfully with your child? By being there, by putting away your work, your phone, your iPad. Just to sidetrack a little, when I bought my pram for my youngest when she was, uh, when she was in my tummy. So I went to the fair and, and the salesperson, how did the salesperson sell me that pram, sold me that pram. He was enticing me by saying that, you know, the cover on top, there's a sleeve for iPad. 
So in this day and age, even eight years ago, you know, this gadget thing is really getting, you know, every parent's or rather even the kids are starting to have this really, really young. And that takes away the quality company that we have with our children. So that's the first, the company and communication. Communication being two-way communication and not one way. So one-way communication would be giving them instructions for them to follow. Of course, we will need to do that sometimes, right? But the communication that I'm talking about here is the two-way communication. So for example, for example, you know, today's the weather is not really good, but maybe you have plans to go for swimming and your kids know that, you know, today we are going for swimming. Yeah, so, but it's, it's raining. We have two options. Number one is we think in our head and start planning and problem solving that. So we could, you know, choose to go to the mall for a walk or, you know, play a game and we decide and we execute. Yeah, so we would have practice executive functioning ourselves. However, how does communication look like? So when this happened, even with very young children, we can involve them, say, you know, hey, you know, it's raining and we won't be able to go out for our swing today as planned. So what can we do? And then you can start to brainstorm or for with younger kids, you could start to have those options and get them to choose one. For older children, you probably would be able to brainstorm together with them. You know, do we want to bake some cookies? We want to watch a movie? Or do we want to play some card games? And if for families that allow, do we want to wear a raincoat and go out and play a little bit since we cannot swing? And so with that kind of communication, we are actually, of course, being there having that company, building that connection. And with that little conversation or communication we have, if we dissect it, we will realize that we are problem solving together. We are also allowing children to delay their gratification because they cannot go for swimming today, but maybe another day when the weather is better. And also perhaps emotional management. So the child could be upset and you could say that, you know, you look a little upset or disappointed that we could not swim. So by verbalizing those feelings, those big feelings that they have, by communicating that, we are also helping them to manage those emotions. So when the emotions are being verbalized and our children or even ourselves will be able to accept them better. And by going through that motion after accepting, it's easier for us to let it go. And all emotions are valid. There's no good or bad emotions. All emotions are valid. So we want the children being able to embrace those emotions that they have. The only difference is how do we appropriately express those emotions? but all the big, small emotions, they are all valid, yeah? So communication and mindful company gives rise to connection. And connection, and I'm going to repeat this again, is the basis of all learnings. And if not, it's a boost to the state of learning. So if you recall, you will know that, you know, when we feel more connected, it could be to the teacher or to our to our friends whom we revise, review our work together with. You know, when we feel that connection, that learning happens faster, and probably we would be able to retain those learning better as well. So that connection is really, really important. Okay. Now, so I would briefly run through this as this would be the things that you could do. I know Dr. Law has already mentioned many really, really useful 
activities that we can do with our kids. In fact, I jot down a few. And now, for those below 12 months old, we could do, you know, pick a bowl, you know, organize their, not organize, establish a routine so that, as I've mentioned earlier, what that does. And I want to talk more about that active listening part. Let me give you an example to illustrate that. So I saw this in a restaurant. I was just sitting next to a, to a, not a family, a mom and a grandma with a crying baby. So what happens was that the baby was reeling, must be really, really hungry. So grandma was carrying the baby and rocking the baby and saying, you know, don't cry and, you know, just keep rocking because the child is like frantically crying, most likely extremely hungry. So mom was trying to prepare the milk and somehow the milk was too hot. So I was trying to cool down that milk. So in this entire, entire process of five, no, 10 to 15 minutes, the child was reeling, mom was preparing, grandma was holding the baby, trying to calm the baby down. So what does it mean by active listening? We might think that, you know, infants, they couldn't verbalize, right? So what it means to actively listen, listen to that infant would be, hey, you know, I know you look, you must be really hungry. That's why you are crying this loud. And mommy is preparing your milk. Look, the milk, you know, we are preparing it. See, I'm shaking it and I'm making it cooler. Do you want to touch it? It's really so can, you know, you can put the milk next near to the baby and ouch, you know, it's really hot. We need to cool it down before you could drink it. When you have this communication or this conversation with the infant, you are actually doing active listening. For those of you who have really young babies at home, try it and you will notice that if we have guessed whatever emotions they are going through or what are they thinking, you will realize that it will soothe them very, very quickly instead of trying to problem solve on our own without communicating with the baby. So in that process of doing that, we would have role play problem solving. So role playing means, you know, you verbalize and, you know, it's like a dance. You, you are doing it together with the child, whether the child is able to verbalize it or not. And through that, what I have, the example that showed, it's about active listening. So you are best guessing what the child is feeling, going through, thinking in his or her mind when he or she is crying for that milk. And also with that, if you have, you manage to soothe the child, you are actually doing emotional management. So all the child's big emotions are being soothed because the child is being hurt. Yeah. And with that, the whole process of communicating, conversing, that emotions, that feelings, how the child feel, think, and the child would be able to hang on for maybe five to 10 minutes when the milk is ready and the child will be happily drinking the milk. And that is impulse control, isn't it? Delayed gratification. And for early years, communicate, communicate, and communicate to build that connection, which is really so important for their learnings, the facilitation of the development of executive functioning skills, and also to read to them, to read to them and build that routine around reading, if you can. With that, I'm going to share this quote by Becky Bailey. It is not... It is really not the book that you are reading, but the lap the child is sitting on. So again, is that connection. And I have three kids. So my, actually out of my three kids, my middle child, that 14 year old is an avid reader. So when he was younger, so that's what we do. We read every night and he won't stay for five seconds. He'll be running off and coming back. But I do it day in, day out because, you know, I have to, I'm reading to my older daughter too, yeah? So day in, day out, we will do that and he will come and go, come and go. Sometimes he will disappear. 
And by six months to, not weeks, all right, I think, by about six months to about nine months, then he started to join us. And to my amazement out of the three, he, he, is, he, he grew to be an avid reader. But when he started off, he's like never there. So we need to have patience and sometimes don't be too hard on yourself, is it? Because, you know, my storytelling skills and all that. So remember, it is not the book you're reading, but the lab the child is sitting on. So what's next? I would like all of us to, including myself, yes, to build, work on building the connection. And that is really, really the connection for all kinds of learnings to happen, inclusive of executive functioning skills. And that is really very important in their life. With that, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joyce, for sharing with us the importance of parent-child connections and how it affects the development of executive function skills of the young ones, as connection is the core ingredients for all of the development. So from what I heard from Ms. Joyce, right, connection is made out of two-way communication and the, the, the company of the parents. Okay, let's welcome all our panel speakers back on screen with us for the Q&A session. Okay, I can see some, I can see that we have quite a number of questions coming in. All right, let's look at the first question. Okay, we have a parent uh, whose child is not attending school. So the question is for children who do not attend childcare, how can parents develop their cognitive and social skills at home? Maybe, uh, can we have Dr. Law to answer this question? Sure. Um, I think I think some of us have addressed that already. Um, I think um, certainly um, there are children who might not attend um, childcare, and it's at home quite a bit. Um, I do think that um, again, it's not about uh, a lot of quantity of you know, working on activity book, worksheets, and all that to build the cognitive skills. It's really, um, you know, if there is a caregiver, um, I know that sometimes both parents work, right? If there is a caregiver who um, is able to even have conversation, like we heard connection with the child, um, that type of stimulation is already um, excellent, right? It doesn't really need to come um, from, you know, doing workbooks and things. I do think that if you have a few books at home, um, I don't know how young um, these children are at your home, but um, even board books, anything with pictures, um, that can start a really good conversation. Um, books can help with social skills too, actually, um, if the child doesn't have a lot of opportunity to go outside because you can look at the expressions of um, whoever's in the book and you say, mm, how does he feel or, or what should we do for this child? So, and I did mention just now the unstructured child directed play that can work on both cognitive and social skills. So if the child says, I just want to be Simba, I'm going to roll at you, right? Um, the parent or the caregiver can actually um, respond by saying like, oh, you look very scary right now. And if the child did something that's not so nice, like just push you over or whatever it is, it is actually opportunity for you to say like, oh, if I'm a, a lion, I'm not going to push people over you know like a lot of times those type of interaction is actually best in in teaching cognitive and social skills doesn't need a lot of materials um don't need to spend money on things um so yeah i'll let the others actually chime in there are just so um, many different ways i just mentioned some uh, simple ones that everyone can do at home Thank you. What about Dr. Ng? 
Do you have anything that you would like to share with the, the parents here? Um, I, I think Evelyn gave some really good examples. Um, and I think the, the thing to remember, I guess, is that there are a lot of things that we can do with our children at home to help build their cognitive and social skills. So um, if, if they're not going to childcare, um, actually, as parents, we, we are actually the, the our main caregiver of our children, right? So there are a lot of things that we can do. So um, another thing that I might add is um, visits to the library. Um, our Singapore libraries are well stocked. There are lots and lots of books for children from age one. Um, there are small books. And um, going back to the point about um, learning about emotions, I'm sure there are books in the library where you can just take and help the children to learn about emotions. Um, let your child pick the books that he or she likes. They may be reading the same book for weeks and weeks on end, but that's fine because they are interested in it. And so as parents, I think you want to engage in a lot of conversations, try to talk to them because language is one of those things that is very helpful um, in terms of um, developing cognitive skills. And also it's very important for communication. When your child is able to tell you what he or she is feeling or experiencing with words, it helps a lot in terms of you trying to provide the correct support. So I think those are just some of the things that I would add on. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for your sharing. All right, we have another question coming in. All right, the question is, I've tried using the suggested strategies to guide my four-year-old boy self-regulation in meltdowns, and he still continues with the meltdown. What should I do next? Do I let him cry until he stops himself? Maybe can we have uh, Miss Joyce to answer this question? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Rachel, okay, for this, right, um, actually what I do is that I coach children and in fact, most of them do have anger management issues. Okay, so the first thing that you could do is, yes, there'll be a lot of strategies and to be honest, really one size doesn't fit all. So what I usually do will, I would be active listening to their, active listen to their big emotions so that helps them to verbalize it. Yeah. So for example, you are really frustrated and therefore with whatever, maybe not having that ice cream. So you're throwing yourself onto the floor. So the two parts that I do with them is the first part will be the feelings that they are feeling at that moment. And the second part would be, I will describe the action that they do. Why? So I build that connection. So the child would see that I could see him, I could hear him, I could feel him, and I'm not labeling him. Okay, so from there, the main thing is the child's big emotions needs to be calmer before we can get to any space to problem solve. So I might not even do it at that point. So basically that needs time and patience for them to be able to have those words to verbalize it to you. And so if it happens so very often, I would maybe walk away or, you know, do what Dr. Law mentioned about active ignoring. However, later on, I will say that, you know, look, we have an issue here. I have an issue with you having meltdowns, as in I will describe that meltdown. So when this happened, you do A, B, C. It's all descriptive on that behavior. And let's work on it. So I will do a session of, you know, um, I call it ABC and I model, I mean, I adapted that. And so basically what it looks like is we talk about what happened before that causes that meltdown. So I'll write it down. So I'll draw it out if they are so young. So we'll draw pictures before that what happens. And I'll have two blocks. One would be the child. I will always ask what's your favorite color and I'll start drawing the child there and say what are you thinking about then and it'll be very interesting. Children will tell you things that you're probably not expecting and then the other portion will be I'll draw myself you know if I'm involved if mommy is involved or daddy is involved you will draw that 
and ask the child, what do you think mommy, daddy, or, you know, teacher Joyce is thinking about when this happened? So get them to verbalize it. Of course, when it comes to your part, you may want to add in because that's what they're thinking about. You know, there you go again. How long is going to end? You know, things like that. Be very honest. Write it down because at that point, the child has, is already calm and collected, right? So we are going through what happened. And next will be, i also write down how do they feel? What's the behavior? And the next big thing would be, what should we realize from this? It's very interesting. A four-year-old be able, because I do it with even three years old. So what do you, what should you realize from this? And when they're able to relook at what's being drawn, they will tell you some things. Of course, with younger kids, you might need to guide them along. And after that, okay, so we have an issue here. How could we problem solve this? So get them to tell you what are the solutions. And for younger children, we need to participate too. So I have this child and um, the child now, it's, he's seven. And so when he was younger, I did this. So he has massive meltdown, okay? Really massive and st will start to throw things around. And, 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 and when we did one of this session and he told me that he, he, was con he was still in that meltdown, not because he couldn't stop, but he could not face himself for that embarrassment when he stopped. Isn't that very interesting? So once we get there, it's so interesting. I said, you know, it's you have big emotions and it's all right. But how you display the emotions is not appropriate. So from then on, his meltdown just went da -da 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 down after he could verbalize it. So he couldn't deal, that, that particular child couldn't deal with the embarrassment that he need to face himself after that meltdown. So this is, this is what I do and yeah with children with issues with their anger or their emotions. Yeah, you know, Dr. Ng or Dr. Law could add in if you have any other ideas. All right, thank you, Ms. Joyce. All right, I, can, I hear that, uh, you know, like um, the, our three uh, panel speaker, right, has been mentioning about listening to the child, you know, listening to the child's feelings and also to describe, you know, uh, the, the meltdown when the child has already come down. Okay, so right now we have the third question. All right, so this question is for Dr. Law. So Dr. Law, could you elaborate further if there's any scientific studies which show children exhibit uh, exhibiting better executive function skills or development with lesser exposure to screen time? Sure. Um, it's actually one of the topics that I do study. Um, so in Singapore, um, we have uh, a few really big um, studies. Uh, they're cohort studies, meaning we follow, you know, kids from actually when they're in the womb um, during the mom's pregnancy all the way. And one of the bigger um, studies is called Gusto. And the kids are now actually 12 years of age. And so we have studied very carefully their screen time. One thing I want to say is that um, screen time and executive function, it might not be a causal thing, because if you think about like homes that might have a lot of screen time, there might be many things happening. It might be grandparents having the background, you know, screen on. It might be, you know, um, a very, uh, there might be a lot of kids or a child with special needs. And so, you know, like, there are just many, many reasons. So, um, so a lot of times when we look at exposure to screen time and um, executive function, we do have to think about screen time as maybe not the cause, but one of the contributing factor. But there are different studies, and I guess I can put that in the um, chat for our PCF staff, Michelle Yao, and maybe she could also um, show it to the audience. Um, one is actually published in BMC Pediatrics, 
which showed that, um, you know, the more that you have watched screen time as an infant at 12 months, so I'm not talking about school age and all that, as an infant, um, there are actually uh, differences in terms of the cognitive outcome of the child at age four and a half. And uh, we have another study looking at social skills. Um, and so I could put that down. And these are all from Singapore. It's the whole population study. Again, um, I just don't want everyone to think that screen time I must be the thing to blame, but um, the message is actually if we're able to limit it and switch it to something that is more interactive, um, that's probably the key. Um, so yeah, so I will put now um, in the chat th those papers that if you want to read those studies, if you don't, don't worry. Um, you can probably find summaries of them uh, around. Um, a really good place to look is actually um, the Health Promotion Board screen time guidance because um, a number of uh, us, including me, helped to put those guidelines together. So you can take a peek um, at those. Thank you, Dr. Law. All right, thank you so much to all our lovely panel speakers for the learning and insightful tips shared. I believe everyone would agree with me that this discussion about executive function skills were very informative and beneficial to us. All right, so um, I, would like, I would now like to invite our NLB staff, uh, Sadida, to share some book recommendations that are relevant to our panel's topic for today. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sadida. I'm an early literacy librarian with the National Library Board. I'm here to share some book recommendations on executive functions. I'll share my screen, uh, my slides now. Okay, so the first book that I'd like to recommend is No Mind Left Behind by Adam J. Cox. The author is a clinical psychologist who aims to share a fresh perspective on child development by suggesting that the achie achievement gap is due to an underactive executive functioning skills. So he provides um, specific strategies to decrease the achievement gap by mastering important cognitive skills. And in this book, you also find case studies and anecdotes that could provide you with validation, support, clarity, and a system for creating positive changes in your child's life. The next book is Parenting Traumatized Children with Developmental Differences, Strategies to Help Your Child's Sensory Processing, Language Development, Executive Function, and Challenging Behaviors by Sarah McLean. This is a comprehensive guide for foster carers and adoptive parents to help children who are coping with sensory and emotional regulation difficulties or struggling with language, communication, or memory. And the final book, which I will talk more about on, and uh, this is a book that Dr. Law also shared on earlier, is Scattered to Focus, Smart Strategies to Improve Your Child's Executive Functioning Skills by Zach Grisham. It is written for parents of children aged 4 to 12 years old who may have ADHD or executive functioning issues. It is an easy read with short and structured chapters. The book has two parts to it. So part one gives readers an understanding of ADHD and executive functions, and it also has a quick assessment tool for you to understand your own level of executive functioning skills and then to understand your child's. So this actually to encourage parents to improve their skills first so that they can help their child later on. The author also creams, uh, aims to create awareness to parents that executive functioning issues is not a character flaw, but they are due to underdeveloped skills and that it is important for parents to instill a growth mindset in their child even if they exhibit these issues. And then in part two, each chapter is dedicated to a specific executive functioning skill. You will get uh, general coaching strategies to help your child develop these skills, um, ideas for you to work with educators to provide support in the school environment, common pitfalls to avoid, and find each appropriate ways to work on the skills at home. So there are many strategies and activities shared in the book that I really like. So firstly, on boosting memory and processing speed, you can get your child to engage in multi-sensory learning as this helps to transfer information from short-term memory to long-term memory. 
So for example, um, while, you're learn, uh, while your child is learning spelling, for instance, you can have your child bounce on a ball after every word he or she spelled. You can also use chunking technique by being more specific when you ask your child a question. For example, tell me three things that you notice about science class. So this helps them to retrieve information more easily. Other than that, you can also help your child learn to stay focused by being outdoors and in nature as this provides an opportunity for your child to focus on something that is moderately stimulating without overwhelming the senses. So in schools, uh, educators can remove distractions at the spot that they want uh, the child to focus on. For example, not to have like decorations behind where you are standing or sitting so that the child does not get distracted when they are trying to focus on what you're teaching. And then on time management, you can also help your child to improve on this by practicing estimating time. Help them understand, for example, what 10 minutes feels like. So maybe for younger children, it might be hard for them to understand like how long is 10 minutes. So you can say like, oh, when we left the school, it was 8, 9 a.m. Now it's 8, 19 a.m. So that they can have a uh, better understanding how long is 10 minutes. Um, so yes, uh, do check out the books. Two of the books I recommended here has the ebook version that you can borrow by visiting the links on the screen. And for the last book, you can find it at the adult lending section under health category in the public libraries. And lastly, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to NLB's resources and programs for children aged 0 to 6 years old. Find out more by scanning the QR code and you could also subscribe to early read mailing list to be notified on upcoming programs, events and to check out recommended reads by librarians. And that is all from me. Thank you. Back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Sadida. All right, before we end this session, here's a quick preview of the virtual webinar that we will be taking place, that will be taking place tomorrow. So at 10.30 in the morning, we will have a webinar on communicating with your child. And at 1.30 in the afternoon, the webinar will focus on the topic of technology in education. So if you would like to re-watch or revisit some of the strategies and topics shared today, you can actually assess the video on our YouTube page at PAP Community Foundation one week after the event. So once again, thank you Dr. Ng, Dr. Law and Ms. Joyce for being with us today and everyone for attending today's parental conference. I hope our parents have benefited from the panels that we have had today. We hope to see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.